Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, so, Q, I wanted to ask you first, this is one of the most beautiful shows on television, and it is also, I think, by a mile, one of the most disturbing. Uh, what is it like for you as an actor to go to such a dark place, especially with the first season where it just was kind of a spiral downwards for your character? Um, it's great. <laughs> um, I mean, I understand why you would ask that question, but the reality is that I... Uh, I get to work with Mads, and I get to work with Lawrence and Caroline and the rest of the cast, and I get to um, work with Brian Fuller's scripts. I see a flower crown, hello. <laughs> and uh, and that's, that's a treat, like every day is a treat. And the, 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 only, the only issue I would say is the temperature in Toronto where we film, but honestly, other than that, I, I, I love it. And I don't have a problem shutting off at the end of the day. I mean, there's, there's darkness, but there's a lot of... Um, <clears throat> It's not bleak, you know. Um, it's very rich material. Uh, a lot of the story in the first season was about how getting in the mindset of the person who might do these terrible things may or may not change Will. Was there a particular moment in the series where you're like, that stood out to you as like, that, that's messed up? <laughs> um, so many. Um, yeah, there was nothing that I found uh, shocking or horrifying. I mean, the reality is that when you're there and the prosthetics that they, they, they build are very impressive, but, but they're prosthetics, right? Um, and the blood you see comes in canisters and, and you know, sorry. It's, it's what, you know, behind the scenes truth. Uh, the, only, uh, the only thing that disturbed me actually was going on set... Um, for those of you who've seen the first season, you know, Dr. Sutcliffe, who's my neurologist, who, who Hannibal um, uh, cuts into a kind of Pez dispenser, right? He opens his head up and, and I walked on set not realizing that that, that, had, that that body had been laid out and he was fully cut open and they'd kind of filled his jaw with blood and it was quite disturbing. But what was more disturbing was that I'm quite, I'm friends with John Benjamin Hickey who plays Dr. Sutcliffe. I'd just done a scene with him like that morning and so <laughs> walking on set and I, oh, okay. Um, I had to walk off and kind of regroup, you know. But no, other than that, I love it. I mean, I, I, I just, actually the sicker the scripts get, the, the more I like it. So uh, what can you tell us about where Will is at? He uh, was arrested. Uh, does he know for sure he's not guilty, or does he have some doubts as well? Yeah, he's, he's in the Baltimore State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. He's under the, the care of Dr. Chilton. Um, and he is, yeah, he's clinging on very firmly to, to, the, to this newfound understanding that he's innocent. But he's still, uh, he, he, the problem is he has nothing to back it up, not only to anybody else, but to himself. Like Hannibal has taken advantage of his uh, of encephalitis, and um, and he has no understanding of what's happened to him. Right, so uh, he's in a very lonely and a slightly desperate place. And on top of that, he's on he's going to be on trial for multiple murders. And he's got the FBI who've turned on him. And he's realizing that that even his friends, even Alana, Jack, and so on, um, not only do, do they not believe him, but they're they're kind of horrified by him. So he's coming to the conclusion that he's going to have to take care of things himself. I think we have a clip uh, showing them talking about this. Yes, which is with Jack and Hannibal, um, which I think you have. And this, this is uh, really pretty early on in the first episode um, with, uh, with them uh, <laughs> over, a, over a nice meal um, discussing, discussing, I guess, where they find themselves and where they find themselves with regards to me. I mean, Will. <laughs> How could you not suspect a man in that suit? <laughs> right? That's my question. Um, so that, uh, that kind of sets up where we are at the beginning of the first season um, in terms of, uh, yeah, well, in terms of their feelings about me. Um, and, uh, and uh, well, there we, there we go, yeah. Um, has the show changed how you feel about gourmet food at all? No, I have always been an experimental eater. <coughs> it's true. And I, I like eating offal and, um, you know, brains. And I, and I try and encourage myself to eat whatever is the, the most unlikely thing on the menu. Um, and I've profited by that. 
So, so where is Hannibal at in the show? We see that he's become, he's kind of taken Will's place, but uh, does Will really know for sure? Like, how, what does Will think of him at this point? What is their relationship like? Right, well, uh, I mean, Will's pretty fed up, <laughs> you know, um, and that uh, he, he's... I think he's still calibrating where he is with Dr. Lecter. I mean, when we first meet him, Will is, is basically emotional. I mean, he's, he's, uh, you know, he's devastated as you would be. He's been framed. He doesn't really understand what's happened to him. The only thing he has to cling on to is the idea of his own innocence and of Hannibal's guilt. Um, and, and over the course of the first episode and going into the second episode, he realizes that the more he proclaims that and the more he expresses those feelings, the worse it looks for him. Like the more he says it was that guy, it was that guy, the more the FBI writing him off as, okay, this guy's at best delusional. Um, so he has to retreat and kind of, um, you know, marshal his strength and, and take a new tack as we move forward. Um, so with Hannibal, and, and, and part of that, that I mean, I don't, I don't want to give you any spoilers, but part of that marshalling his strength and, and is, is, okay, how am I going to take a new tack with Hannibal I need to, I need to um, reopen some kind of communication, some kind of relationship with Hannibal, um, which I was glad of because I like acting with Mads. And um, that's tough because you can't con Hannibal, right? He's unconnable, um, kind of. So there we go. Uh, part of the relationship between them in the first season was about how Hannibal saw Will as maybe his first and only friend. Yeah. Does that... Is that still how he looks at Will, considering he also managed to destroy his life? Yeah, I think the, the way he sees it, it was, it was like tough love, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and as Mad said in that little interview, um, he didn't uh, set everything up with the intention of framing me, um, either because it would have been a nice plan to absolve himself or, or out of malice. He just did it when, when it became the only way out of, um, you know, being found guilty himself, right? Uh, he wanted to uh, convince me that the side of myself I was running scared of was in fact the side I should embrace. And that for him was an act of friendship. And, and as, a, as a kind of side um, effect of that, he would gain a friend also. And I think he still feels like that. In fact, I think that the vulnerability Hannibal has in the second season is exactly that, that he's put his best friend in jail and he wants him back. And that Will begins to come to a point of understanding that and realizes that that gives him a certain amount of leverage. So I think we have a clip of the two of them together. Is there anything you want to say? Ahead no, of just that this is, um, this is uh, early on when I'm not so happy with him. Yeah. It's a little Thomas Harris quote in there, I think. Um, well, I would assume that you're not getting out of that cell in the immediate future in the show. What is it like to kind of have that restriction in terms of your acting? Oh, God. Uh, yeah, we're out of that onesie. <laughs> um, I, uh, I thought it was, I mean, it was great, and it is kind of fun, and it, it feels like a real part of the, uh, the language of the books and the movies. You're behind bars, you're in the, the, you know, in the onesie. It's, it's very cool. But technically speaking, being in a 10 by 10, 10 jail cell with only one open wall with bars in it is really restrictive and you realize like on day one the other thing is you film all your scenes back to back because they're like okay great well we've got Will in this box we'll just shoot everything right now you know um, and you realize like after the third scene well you know hell I, 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 I did that scene I sat on my bunk and then in the second scene I paced up and down and the third scene I kind of came up to the buzz I've got nothing left you know I <laughs> Uh, there was a little, they had built a little, because you have them in cells, like a toilet, you know, that was attached to the wall. And I just kind of wanted to find an opportunity to sit on that, but it, did, it was never quite, quite the moment. Um, so there's that, that's one thing. And, uh, and, and in a sense, emotionally, that holds true as well, because Will is being, in the first episode in particular, being visited by a kind of roster of, uh, of you know, Jack comes to him, Alana comes to him, Hannibal comes to him, and, and, and other people as well. And he's playing out, not identical, but similar beats of, you know, I'm innocent, and, you know, and, and uh, so you have to, I had to find ways to, to kind of redirect that. And then the other thing, the third thing is that, so you're in the cell, then there's the bars, then there's the camera, so you're always aware that, that basically you've just got to hit your mark to an inch, or, or there's a bar in the way, and then they can't use it. So the camera guys are behind, the, they're going like, 
and it doesn't exactly add up to spontaneity. You know, it doesn't doesn't um, doesn't free you up very much. So, um, without giving anything away, there were moments. There have been moments when I've not been in my cell, and that's been kind of nice. Uh, you mentioned this a little bit before, but uh, can you tell us a bit about where your character is at with uh, the other characters? It seems like Jack is is pretty quick to believe in his guilt. Uh, is that true? And what about uh, you know Alana and the others? Yeah, there's a debate going on uh, at the beginning of the season uh, as to whether I'm a, an intelligent psychopath who has uh, de- deliberately and coldly gone about creating this this situation, and that my whole story about you know blackouts and so on is an elaborate ruse or whether, whether in fact I did these things but I was unconscious when I did them. Like those are the only two options that are being discussed. Um, so, so Alana, for example, is uh, adhering to the second view and urging me to, to defend myself and, and get, you know, get legal defense and so on. And I'm basically saying, well, r- really? Do you think that's supportive? That, that I just did it I, like I didn't mean to? Um, so, so uh, yeah, as I say, um, Will's going through this in a different way with different people, but he's rapidly coming to the conclusion that he's not going to get any substantial support from anywhere but himself. Yeah, there's, a, there's a certain kind of ruthlessness that's coming, that's coming through to Will, right? Um, he, he always, there was something he was frightened of in the first season about himself, and he's coming to the conclusion that he's going to have to face up to and embrace that side of himself if he's going to get anywhere. So uh, showrunner Brian Fuller is known for having these really distinctive visual style to his shows, and this is no different. It does have this, in the first season, it had a very nightmarish quality, uh, but very poetic as well. Now Will is no longer suffering from encephalitis. Has that changed those qualities, or is that still part of the show? Well, I think that Hannibal has kind of, um, as, as he says in that clip, is now inside Will's brain. And, and in fact, you know, I, I don't know exactly at what point Will s- was supposed to have been suffering the, the onset of encephalitis, but, but the symptoms didn't arrive to kind of halfway through the first season. My feeling is that his brain was already, um, y- you know, inflamed in a different way from birth. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and certainly within the confines of the jail, not only does is he prey to that kind of imagination, but he also is employing it. I don't know if anybody here has read the book Hannibal, um, but, uh, but there's descriptions of Hannibal um, and the techniques that he employed when he was in jail um, called his mind palace, right? Uh, when he, he constructed an elaborate kind of inner sanctum to go to inside his brain in which he stored his memories. So we... I mean, in a very, very minor way, took that idea that Will can, can use his imagination um, as, a, as a place of retreat to, like, shut out Chilton's stupid babbling and, or whatever it might be um, and, and go and, and to kind of a, a place of meditation and, and what happens just as the stag started to invade his dream life in the first season, so his place of calm in the second season starts getting invaded to a certain degree by this bleaker imagery. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, the show as a prequel? Uh, You know, many people are, have some idea at least uh, through the books or through the films about where these characters end up. It does seem like it gives a bit of uh, a sense of another layer of foreshadowing or doom to to the series that it plays with a bit. Do you agree? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, but but then again, you know, in in Red Dragon, uh, in which describes the you know, uh, Will Graham and Hannibal for the first time, you get maybe 15 pages worth of backstory um, and you learn that Will put put Hannibal away um, and then there's a few snippets. You actually hear about Garrett Jacob Hobbs, who's the guy that I shoot in the first episode of the first season. You know that I shot him in his kitchen, that he almost killed his daughter, that he that while he was bleeding out, he says to me, you see, you see, you know, that's all in the book, but it's like a paragraph. And somehow Brian Fuller saw that and he and he just extrapolated from it the whole the whole of the story. You you know that at some point that Will was um, institutionalized. Although I think in Red Dragon he's be, he's actually was institutionalized more for depression um, than for being a serial killer. But you know, give or take. And um, so uh, yeah, we we took a very small amount of information and deepened it and and darkened it. I think that's that's certainly true. Yeah. 
So, but when we get to Red Dragon, perversely, we're going to make it a comedy. So there you go. Had you been a fan of the books or the, and the films before? Uh, I had seen, uh, saw Silence of the Lambs when it came out, like everybody else, which was like when I was at school. Um, and I saw some of the movies after that, but that was, that was always the one, you know. I hadn't read the books. So when I signed on for the TV show, it was because of meeting Brian. Um, he, he, I, I had like a half hour meeting with Brian and he described this last season we did. He described the second season, the third season, the fourth season. I mean, turned out it was all kind of approximations, but still, uh, he had a very rich vision of what he wanted to do with the characters and, and, and kind of explain why would you go back to these characters, you know, and he made that abundantly clear. So on the basis of that and his first script, I signed up. And then I went and I read Red Dragon and I realized, oh God, I've really got myself into something here. Like this character is, this character is crazy, you know? Um, and, but but, but um, the, the other way of saying that is that there was a huge amount of information in that book, like an incredible blueprint for an actor to go to. And, and it's, it's basically an, uh, a really in-depth description of the inside of Will Graham's head, most of that novel. So I had, a, I had that to work from. I'm going to open things up for questions in a second, but I did want to ask you first, uh, the, the opening sequence of the premiere was released online, this kind of epic fight between uh, Mads and Lawrence Fishburne. Uh, is there anything you can tell us about that? And are we, can we see, expect to see any action scenes with Will, or is he more about the life of the mind? Oh, Will, Will an action, uh, let me think. Yeah, no, no, there's a, there's a few moments. I mean, I have a stunt double. <laughs> um, <laughs> But but Will is more, uh, if he has a, a superpower, if you like, uh, it is more about a kind of, uh, as I was saying, owning up to his own darkness and his ability to manipulate. You know, with, with Hannibal is so pure in that way that, that we can believe almost magical, impossible things of him. You know, he, he pulls things off that are, let's be honest, totally impossible. And I think that you can believe of Will that, that if he opens that door in his mind, he can also go to that place. Um, but that said, we've still got three episodes left to film of the last of the second season, so maybe I kick the crap out of somebody. I don't know. So um, we talked about how Hannibal feels about their friendship, and we heard what Will had to say. But do you really think it'll take a million years for the light of friendship to come back, or is there a chance? But think how many seasons that is. <laughs> <laughs> Much as I would love that. Um, do you think there's a chance Will could sort of see things? I mean, that's what Will does. He sees things other people's way. Do you think he could understand what Hannibal was doing and forgive him a little? Well, let me put it this way. I think that um, as we go through this season, um, you see Will realizing that uh, if he wants to, to kind of get under Hannibal's radar, if he wants Hannibal to, to um, let his defenses down, right, Will is going to have to get close to him, and he's going to have to be scrupulously honest, I mean, Will, about himself. And he has to be honest with himself about himself. So he's walking a very dangerous line there, right? He's going to have to walk close to the fire, if you like. Um, now, I don't give anything away, because we're getting way into the, the back end of the season, you know. But... Um, but uh, yeah, the, the only chance he has uh, really to, not so much to clear his name, but to reset his life and everything that he's lost in terms of his innocence. I don't mean like in court, I mean, you know, his pure innocence um, is gonna involve re-engaging Hannibal. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hi. So um, a lot of shows have come up, like shows that hinge on violence or violent themes have often come under fire for you know, falling into certain traps, like the violence is very gender-based or in a problematic way or it's sexualized or it's gratuitous. Hannibal has very elegantly managed to dodge those traps, I feel, but I was wondering if you could maybe speak to, you know, as an actor, how you approach, you know, acting in pieces or choosing projects that hinge on violence and the politics of violence, how you approach that in your work? If yeah. that's not too weird a question. <laughs> no, no, I don't think it's a weird question at all. I think it's a good question. Um, I, I think that, uh, uh, well, first up, I have, no, I have no innate problem with violence. Um, I mean, in entertainment. I don't think you, you're not gonna get away with it, get away from it suddenly. You might get away with it, but you're not gonna get away from it. Um, I completely agree with what you said uh, about 
things that are both prevalent and the things that I hope we've avoided, which are um, the kind of desensitizing our response to violence and making it uh, uh, just a, a kind of pedestrian thing that we hardly notice anymore. That's not true of, of our show, I think, and I'm glad of it. And, and also um, uh, kind of casually and, and uh, predominantly um, depicting violence against women and sexual violence particularly or you know, rape or whatever. Um, that's just not something that we do, and, and I can't take credit for that, but, because I didn't write it, but I'm kind of glad and happy that that is the show that I'm part of. For me, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not interested in, in violence as a kind of a cheap tool in storytelling, right? As a, well, well, we can just get there quicker if we just like blow this guy away, you know? It's like, people love that, right, you know? Um, I think that what's interesting to me is the consequences of, of violence and, you know, emotional and otherwise. And that's kind of what this show trucks in, um, the, the, the aftermath of violence, even in its depiction of violence itself. You, you, there, there is obviously, I mean, I shoot Garrett Jacob Hobbs in the first episode, but the, that, the, it's not there because we want to see somebody get shot in a kitchen. It's there because we want to see the entire season that, that, that comes out of that. Yeah, I didn't hear what you said, but I completely agree with you. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, and physically, the aftermath of violence in, in the tableaus that, that are created, you know, these, these preposterous and, and obviously beyond the bounds of, of reality in a sense, but these crimes that we depict and then the, the, um, the quite beautiful imagery that, that comes out of that. So that is, uh, that's what interests me. What do you think about this poster? Because you look so scary. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe you are very cool, nice, and funny guy. Uh, then one more. Uh, I love Lawrence Fishburne, but I believe he's like uh, you know, like you, funny and nice guy. So how's working with him? Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, I like the poster too. I got to wear the mask. Right, the mask is great. Um, although a little claustrophobic. Um, I think that the. The line, right, embrace the madness, <clears throat> it kind of goes back to what I was saying about re-engaging with Hannibal, and that is, the, that is the theme of the season. But basically, the mask is cool. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I like playing a character who's not very nice. <laughs> I mean, I like Will, I, I, I really do, but, but I like that he doesn't, he doesn't engage in the normal social, you know, oh, hi, how do you do, you know, he's just, he has no politeness, which I enjoy. Um, and uh, what else? Oh, Lawrence Fishburne. He's a super, super cool guy. Really, really sweet guy. Um, I was very kind of thrilled to work with him when, when I heard that he was going to maybe be involved. And like you, probably, I've watched him since Apocalypse Now. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't watching movies when Apocalypse Now came out, but, you know, I've seen him in great films for years, and he's just a nice, humble, cool guy. Hello. Hello. Um, has playing Will Graham opened your mind at all to the world of mental health? Like, have you learned something new through playing Will? Uh, I would have to, honestly, no. Um, and the, I think I came into uh, the, the role and the job with some understanding based on previous work that I'd done, which, which I, which not that there was a direct correlation, but that it helped me kind of figure out who he might be. Um, but but Will's, uh, Will's own predicament, uh, and particularly the encephalitis, is a bit like the violence um, and so much else in the show, is, is really very heightened. I mean, like our job as actors, I suppose, is to find a way to believe it and make it real and allow you to believe it so that the other stuff can take off. Um, so if I'd been there like reading medical textbooks and calling Brian and saying like, Brian, are they just like, nobody would do this. <laughs> then that would not have been very helpful. Um, I, I mean, to answer, to go back to what I was saying before, I, I did, I, I kind of thought early on about uh, the notion of, a, of, of somebody who's, in, on the opposite of being on the autistic spectrum. That's the way I envisioned him, right? There are people who have, have no ability to read other people and, and who are very much shut off and have no control over that. And, I, and then there's us, so we consider ourselves, most of us, um, 
neurotypical, neurotypical people, right, to be down one end of that spectrum. I, well, what if, the, if we're just all at the middle of the spectrum and it extends in the other direction, there are people who have quite the opposite problem. And I believe this to be true. Like, um, probably a lot of people that self-identify as being psychic or whatever, people who can't control the information coming through to them and read the different uh, pieces of information coming off all of us all the time uh, in a much more porous way. Um, and then if that person happened to be particularly attuned to a serial killer, <laughs> you know, that would be Will. So that's how I thought about it. So we know what happens to Will uh, in the books with Dollarhide, and so I was curious if that was something we were ever going to have to, I would say dread, because I would hate anything to happen to Will in the series if, we were, if that was something we had to worry about. <laughs> I can't stop you worrying. <laughs> um, I, I don't know is the honest answer. I mean, we're definitely going into, I mean, you know, God willing, right? If you all actually watch it and don't illegally download it, <laughs> that would be good. That'll give us a third season. Um, the, the, we'll go into Red Dragon. <clears throat> but, but I think, you know, as we, as we get further and further into this world that we're creating, it's still Thomas Harris's world, but we get a little bit more elbow room. Um, and you'll see some characters coming in in this season that you may have read about, you know, um, the Verges and so on. Um, and Brian is able to, I think, I don't want to say take liberties, but, but you know, in, invest his own creativity in it. So I hope that by the time we get to Red Dragon, we'll also be able to do our own thing because a lot of people have read Red Dragon. And if suddenly we were just like following the exact chapter by chapter layout, well, that would be no fun. We've spent two years trying to surprise everybody. So... Um, and that includes me. So I, I'm going to, it's a slight cheat, a slight ducking of the question, but, but I, I don't know. Um, I, listen, I also would like to think that if we do get to that story, there'd be life for Will Graham in the story afterwards. So we'll see. Hi. Hi. Okay, I'm just going to take my chance right now. I made you a Will doll. Oh. If I could give it to you. Yes, please. Yes. Thank and you. And I actually You're do so have kind. a question too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> This is season one, Will. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> season two will come up next. Okay, I do have a question. So this show is very gruesome and very dark. But we've seen in the DVD that there are bloopers in when you guys were filming this. How often does this happen and who usually get like breaks out of character in the cast? Well, I've got to say that since we realized at the end of season one that they'd made a blooper reel. I've noticed in season two that I think people are trying a little harder to get on the blooper reel. <laughs> and I can't claim to be completely innocent there. <laughs> because you want to be on the blooper reel, you know. Um, uh, but I would have to say Scott Thompson, um, right, who plays Jimmy Price. Uh, Scott is a very funny man. And um, I don't know if any of you have seen him on the Colbert Report uh, over the last few weeks during the Olympics. He went out to the the Sochi Olympics as uh, Colbert's, as his buddy, right? Yeah, a buddy Cole. Um, it's extremely funny, and and he he's he's a he's a brilliant guy, but he doesn't make it easy sometimes to keep a straight face. Thank you, thank you for the doll. I give it to my son and freak him out. Hi, um, I guess I was wondering about last season while you were filming. Were there any scenes, I guess, to you in particular that stood out as being very like memorable to film, like either intense or something funny happened? Or yeah, um, you know, uh, the I I really liked filming the scene, uh, which I thought was going to be difficult, and it was in some ways, which is in Hannibal's. Um, dining room, when I show up with Gideon, I'm full-blown encephalitis. I think it's Garrett Jacob Hobbs, right? And I've, he sit down at the end of the table. There was something about that scene that was fun because it was quite kind of a tightrope. It felt fairly extreme because I'm going through a full meltdown. And um, I think it was Mads' suggestion quite late in the day that we should do a full take with nobody at the foot of the table as well. Which, which makes that if you see the final scene cut together, there's a moment when I say, what do you see? And he turns around and says, well, I don't see anything. And there's nobody there. So we were kind of ever so, so slightly, I don't want to say making it up as we went along, but I know that Brian had, Brian had incorporated the idea of my hallucinating Garrett Jacob Hobbs in place of Gideon. That had been a fairly late addition. So it all felt kind of fun and, and you know, of the moment. 
And weirdly, sometimes the scenes that you go in thinking, oh, this is going to be so intense. I don't know how I'm going to get through it. They're, they're just really funny and really easy. And, and it kind of ended up like that. Yeah, I also like the scene in the, in the first episode when I'm in the bathroom and Lawrence comes in and just screams at that poor guy. I use the ladies' room, you know, because the poor, the guy, he was an extra, and he, I mean, he almost just peed right there. He was just, he had no idea what was happening. All right, everyone. Uh, season two of Hannibal premieres tonight on NBC at 10 p.m. Can I get a round of applause for Hugh Dancy? Thank you for coming. <laughs>